I'm Dr. Michelle Kittleson, a heart failure transplant cardiologist at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, California. So the three trials that I'm most excited about are Fine Arts, Helios B, and Reshape Heart Failure 2. So let's start with Fine Arts. So Fine Arts was a randomized placebo-controlled trial of finerenone, a non-steroidal mineralocorticoid antagonist in 6,000 patients with heart failure and EF 40% or greater. The primary outcome was a composite of total worsening heart failure events, a FEN designed as a first or recurrent unplanned hospitalization or urgent visit for heart failure, and death from cardiovascular cause. So ushering a new era of actually positive trials in patients with heart failure and EF 40% or higher, finally, Fine Arts met its primary endpoint driven by a reduction in worsening heart failure events with an event rate, rate ratio of 0.82. There was no difference in cardiovascular death. This was driven by a decrease in unplanned heart failure events. So the mineralocorticoid antagonists are having a moment right now in HEFPEF. Should we be surprised? So for those of you who remember the TOPCAT trial, which came out 10 years ago, that was a randomized controlled trial of spironolactone, another mineralocorticoid antagonist in patients with heart failure, EF 40%, 45% or higher. The trial did not meet its primary endpoint of a reduction in cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization, but did meet its secondary endpoint. But what was even more fascinating is when a regional analysis was performed, there was significant var variation. Half of the patients came from North and South America. Half of patients came from Russia and Georgia. And what they found is patients from Russia and Georgia were very different. They had very low, unexpectedly low event rates for patients ostensibly who had HEFPEF. And they didn't have an expected bump in potassium and creatinine like patients in the Americas did when they were ostensibly on a mineralocorticoid antagonist. So we think about randomized controlled trials as the truth, but that depends on appropriate enrollment of the right patients receiving the right interventions. And in TopCat for half of patients, it appears that might not be the case. So are all mineralocorticoid antagonists beneficial in patients with heart failure and an EF of 40% or higher, or is finerenone special as fine arts has shown us a positive endpoint? Well, if you look at the pharmacology, it appears to affect the heart more than the kidneys. It has less risk of hyperkalemia. It also has evidence of benefit in patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease, with a reduction in CKD progression and cardiovascular events. That's Fidelio DKD and Figaro DKD. And it's unlikely that anyone's ever going to perform a randomized head-to-head head -head comparison of spironolactone and finerenone. We have to rely on judgment and experience. So my judgment and experience tells me that it should be a class effect and that you, if cost is no option, prescribe finerenone based on the evidence. But if cost is a concern, then the tried and true generic mineralocorticoid antagonist spironolactone or plerinone should be used for your patients. So Helios B. So cardiac amyloidosis is also experiencing a moment in cardiology. As you know, it's a condition where there's a protein that the body produces naturally that for reasons we don't understand decides to deposit in the myocardium, resulting in a restrictive cardiomyopathy. The two most common sources of this abnormal protein are immunoglobulin light chains, AL cardiomyopathy, or the transthyretin TTR protein, TTR cardiomyopathy, which in turn can have one of two sources a variant in the gene or the wild type form. So the protein just doesn't infiltrate the myocardium. It's also important to note it goes other places as well, namely, particularly in some of the variant forms, the nerves causing a sensory peripheral or, auto and, or autonomic neuropathy, which can lead to significant debility. So currently, the only evidence-based, guideline-recommended, FDA-approved therapy for transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis is tefamidus. Tefamidus is a TTR stabilizer, which means it keeps the protein in its happy tetramer form, so it doesn't dissociate form fibrils and deposit into the myocardium. The landmark trial was the ATTR-ACT trial, which showed in patients with class 1 to 3 symptoms and ATTR cardiomyopathy, there's a reduction in cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. 
There's similar promising results for another stabilizer, Acaramidus and the attribute CM trial, though it is not currently approved for use. But are there other ways to prevent TTR from depositing in tissues? Yes, there are. You don't just have to stabilize the protein. You could also silence its production with mRNA inhibitors. So a number of these agents have been tested in clinical trials and are approved for use, but they've only been tested and approved in the variant form of TTR amyloidosis with neuropathy. Now, while it stands to reason that if they work for neuropathy, they should also work for cardiomyopathy, they had not been rigorously tested until Helios B. So Helios B, 655 patients, with ATTR cardiomyopathy, class one to three symptoms, randomized to a TTR silencer of Utriceran versus placebo. The primary endpoint was a composite of death from any cause and recurrent cardiovascular events. The trial met its primary endpoint, reduction both death and cardiovascular events. The benefit was also seen in the 60% of patients in the trial who were not receiving tefamidus. So this is a huge win for patients living with transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis, but it raises two very important questions. First, what should standard of care be for patients living with this condition? Should it be a stabilizer like defamidus or aparamidus? Should it be a silencer like butricerin or both? The efficacy of silencers and stabilizers is impossible to compare given the difference in patient populations across the trials. If we assume both are effective, which seems true, then how does a clinician choose? Honestly, sometimes it boils down to what would patients prefer? So let's consider the factors. One may be cost. Tefamidus in the United States has an astonishing sticker price of about $250,000 a year, though through lots of paperwork and patient assistance programs, most patients ultimately have the price reduced to an affordable amount. If acaramidus or patricerin are somehow cheaper, that may drive the choice. The next factor may be convenience. Tefamidus and acaramidus are both pills, easy to take. Butricerin is a subcutaneous injection every three months, currently has to be administered by a healthcare professional, though one would assume self-administration should be possible. Some patients might prefer a pill, others an injection only four times a year. The final factor is medical. So one could imagine a situation where the use of a silencer to stop protein production would render use of a stabilizer unnecessary or superfluous because if you silence TTR, what's left to stabilize? So there is trials that do indicate that butricerin results in a maximum 80% reduction in TTR production. So will standard of care become checking TTR levels, pretty easy as it's also known as pre-albumin, a routine blood test, after initiation of a silencer to assess the need for a stabilizer? These are the practical clinical questions left to be addressed. And the second important research question is, What's next on the horizon? The stabilizers and silencers only slow or stop progression. They don't reverse what damage has already been done. The holy grail will likely be accomplished by monoclonal antibodies, which do seem in early phase two trials to cause regression reversal of existing organ damage. So we have to stay tuned for those studies. So for now, give tefamidus to your patients with transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis and await the likely FDA approval of acaramidus and butricerin. Once approved, then consider what is best for your patient, factoring in cost, convenience, and potentially TTR levels. So the third trial I'd like to highlight is Reshape Heart Failure 2, a trial of mitral valve transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair, or TIR, in patients with secondary symptomatic moderate to severe mitral regurgitation. Secondary, of course, means it's not the valve's fault, it's the ventricle's fault. That is dilation of the ventricle, reduced ejection fraction, then leads to secondary mitral regurgitation. So let's take a step back and look at the landscape and the context. So the MITRE FR trial of TIR added to optimal medical therapy versus optimal medical therapy alone delivered neutral results in this patient population. The authors reported similar rates of heart failure events, cardiovascular death, and overall death in both groups. 
In contrast, the COAPT trial reported that adding tear dramatically reduced heart failure events, cardiovascular death, and overall death. The effect size for the primary endpoint was absolute 32% reduction, number needed to treat of three. So remember how I said earlier that randomized controlled trials only deliver the truth when we consider the patient population? The biggest strength of COAPT is that the trial was careful to include only patients with chronic, moderate to severe secondary mitral regurgitation that was not too severe. That is, their ejection fraction couldn't be less than 20%, their LV size couldn't be more than seven centimeters, their pulmonary systolic pressures couldn't be more than 70, and not too mild. That is, their severe MR had to persist after optimization of guideline-directed medical therapy. And the results of co-op resulted in a class 2A indication for mitral valve tear in the 2022 heart failure guidelines from the AHA, ACC, HFSA for only those patients who met those specific COACT criteria of optimization of medical therapy and echo parameters. So in that now, we had the reshape HF2 trial, randomized 505 patients with secondary MR, reduced LV function, symptomatic heart failure, despite medical therapy, to tier or ongoing medical therapy. The three primary endpoints were a composite of first or recurrent heart failure uh, events, I'm sorry, hospitalizations or cardiovascular death, two, first or recurrent hospitalizations for heart failure, and three, change from baseline to 12 months in the score on the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire, a quality of life measure. The trial met its endpoints among patients with moderate to severe functional mitral regurgitation who received medical therapy, the addition of mitral valve tear led to a lower rate of first or recurrent heart failure hospitalization or cardiovascular death, lower rate of first or recurrent heart failure hospitalization and better health status. So should we be excited? The short answer is yes. The longer answer is there are some concerns with the trial. It took eight years to enroll 505 patients at 30 centers, which makes you wonder about how carefully curated these patients were and whether the results are generalizable. Second, it's interesting that there was a reduction in heart failure hospitalization, but not total hospitalization. So did non-heart failure hospitalizations increase for some reason? And also there was greater premature trial termination in the placebo groups, who makes you wonder, because it isn't blinded, if the trial, if the clinicians involved in the trial really wanted their patients to get tear. So how do we reconcile these results with those of mitra FR and COAPT? Again, harken back to judgment and experience. If patients have symptomatic severe MR that's not too mild, that means it does not improve with GDMT optimization and not too severe, that is their LV size, EF, and pulmonary pressures aren't too awful, then consider mitral valve tear as part of your heart failure toolkit. And there you have it. Fine arts, phenarinone in heart failure with EF 40% or higher, Helios B, butricerin in transthyroidin cardiac amyloidosis, and reshape heart failure 2, mitral valve tear and symptomatic functional MR. I hope you found these synopses helpful. Thanks for listening. Thank you.